you. All right, family. It is uh, by the people media. I'm gonna put that up in the um, in the jumbotron. I wanted to welcome everybody here uh, to our uh, topic, which is Queen Mother Audley Moore's reparations response to NARC and COBRA IBW21. What we're doing is we're going to do a breakdown and Arthur Ward from the Freedmen in Chicago, Angie from the Freedmen in Baltimore, Baltimore Freedmen, uh, we are going to discuss something really important. Um, and we want you to share this space out if you have opportunity to please, please share it out. We want to get more people in to hear and to ask questions and, and things of that nature. But um, Queen Mother Audley Moore's reparations response to NARC and COBRA and IBW21. See, a lot of times things happen for a reason. And uh, sometimes the elders actually kind of prepare us, even though they may not be here and, and body anymore, they, their spirit really still presses on in what they write. So that's why it's important that if we have something that we write and we share it, you know, with the next generation and let them know. But I want Arthur Ward um, to come in and author can you tell everybody the story of how you uh, received this pamphlet by uh, Queen Mother Audley, Audley A. Moore? Okay, well, um, actually, uh, I had heard of Queen Mother Moore off and on growing up because, you know, my parents were, um, how should I say, Muslim nationalists. They, were, they belonged to the Nation of Islam. And so not only did I hear about people uh, within the movement of the Nation of Islam, but because of the fact that uh, mm -hmm. discussions were always being held about uh, people outside the Nation of Islam that were fighting for Black liberation, uh, their names always came up. Um, later on, though, <clears throat> her name did not come strongly into my mind until I started uh, dealing with the Adolf movement. Um, it was uh, my quest to get this material started after the uh, the first Adolf uh, uh, convening in Louisville, okay? And uh, that was not only the place that I started getting more curious about HR 40, but then after I got, after I got home, uh, we went to a in Cobra presentation uh, at one of the uh, uh, community centers here in Chicago. And just about every speaker there mentioned Callie House and Queen Mother Moore. As a matter of fact, they had pictures of just these two ladies up on the stage. I said, okay. So I started doing research on both of them. Now on Callie House, uh, there's ample material. There's a whole book uh, written by, I think it was uh, Mary Frances Berry. And there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet and in, in, in in uh, um, university papers regarding Cali House, but Queen Mother Moore, oh, uh, not so much. Um, and I uh, had lunch with Conrad Will, Will mm -hmm. uh, and I talked about. I asked him about why isn't it there? Why isn't you guys talk about Queen Mother Moore so damn much? Why isn't there more material out there uh, about her? And he kind of uh, changed the subject at that point. So then I was on, from that point, I was on a three year quest to find something written by this woman because people said that she wrote stuff. Okay, if she wrote stuff, where is it? All right. And uh, eventually I found out about the existence of this pamphlet, uh, Money for Negroes, um, uh, Why Reparations? Okay, Money for Negroes. And then, you know, I'm asking some of the old heads in the movement, do they have a copy? They said, no, nah, we know about it, but we don't have a copy of that. Uh, and then I started searching in other places. Finally, uh, a few months ago, I finally found the University of Florida and they had a, uh, they had a copy of it and they were willing to scan the, uh, the, uh, the pamphlet for me 
And then just about almost as soon as I got it, not too long after I got it, that's when I started uh, releasing it to people. I, I sent a copy to Dr. Darity. I sent a copy to uh, Naheem. I sent a copy to Chad and Friday. And, I, and, mm-hmm. and the reason why I sent out a copy is I didn't, what I'm doing right now, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I gave those copies out because I, I was giving it to people that are able to do this kind of thing better than me. But here we are, and this is what we're doing right now. But when I read this thing, I, I expected to see Pan-African talk. No, there's no Pan-African talk in this thing whatsoever. It is the Freedmen, Ados, uh, foundational American, Black American, Native Black, whatever, position of specificity as far as like reparations for the Black people that were uh, uh, descendant of slaves in this country. And I said, oh, no wonder the panties don't like this thing being out. Now, this thing is extremely rare. Uh, there are about maybe six or seven universities uh, in the world that have a copy of this. The copy that the University uh, of Florida has is fragile, um, but uh, they were able to make me a scanned copy of it. And then uh, because of the fact that the thing is, it was never copyrighted, uh, it is in the public domain. So therefore, you know, things in the public domain, you can use them freely without the permission of the former owner. And so therefore, I decided to take the time to publish all 12 pages on my blog so that everybody can see what this woman said. So that, that's, that's, that's what I have to say at this point. Uh, Roz, Angie? Okay. Sure. Thank you so much, Arthur. I mean, I have my copy also. I'm hoping I was one of the first 10 people that you sent it to because this is really important. Thank you, Arthur. Um, This is really important because, you know, we're doing these pages. uh, I mean, yeah, we're doing these Twitter spaces in order for us to educate, better educate our people. So if people are coming in and they're they're not mentioning... um, Queen Audley Moore, but they're Pan-Africanists. This is something we need to go over. The title of it is a like a green um, bound um, book. And yep. it says, Why Reparation? Money for Negroes. I don't remember anybody from the Caribbean calling themselves Negroes, nor anybody from Africa. Do you? No. I mean, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. And it says, (laughs) reparations is the battle cry for the economic and social freedom of more than 25 million descendants of American slaves by Mrs. Audley A. Moore, president, founder of the Reparations Committee for Descendants of American Slaves. And the price was one dollar. You know what? The the, the rep. That sounds like a, a chapter that some mm-hmm. Freeman organization would uh would create right now. Uh, actually, yeah, it does. It it does sound <laughs> like something like that somebody would have maybe come up a uh, descendants of, of American slaves. Yeah. Uh yeah. And, and she she did not mm-hmm. say anything about slavery. She said slaves. So it's right. very clear in Negroes. And on the right. next page is her picture, Mrs. Audley M. Moore, and her foreword. Um, this work is dedicated to the Herald Dispatch newspaper and the Reparations Committee Incorporated for their unselfish, uncompromising determination to contribute towards a peaceful solution of the reparations problem, which will undoubtedly become a social battle cry in the immediate future the likes of which this country had never heard be- he- hither, here. I'm sorry, heretofore. <laughs> Audley M. Moore. Wow. So, wow, family, we were talking about, um, you know, looking into the future. She basically is talking about today. Now, this happened back in, what, Arthur? This had to be like the 60s, 70s. 63. No. Thank you. Yes, 19... it was 63 because it was 100 years. She mentions the 100 years after slavery ended in 1863. So this was in 1963 that she wrote these words that are talking to us in the year 2022. So I don't want that to be lost on anybody. Go ahead, Arthur. I'm sorry. Yes. Also, uh, 
this thing was published a few months before President Kennedy was assassinated. Now, she had, an, I don't know if she did or not, but I do know in my digging that she had intended to mail a copy of this to President Kennedy. I don't know if she accomplished that or not. But this is, this is the time period that we're looking at right now. Also, look at where the Reparations Committee is uh, located. It's in, on 1431 West Jefferson Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. Ain't that where AB 3121 been? been uh, that yes, way? sir. <laughs> OK. Now, um, but I would like to, I would like to know what was the uh, mental uh, change or, 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 or mental enlightenment that anyone uh, acquired or, or came up with after they read this pamphlet? Understanding that this is the most, this is the most mascoted, marketed image or person in the Pan-African movement. But when it comes to her personal uh, attitude as far as like reparations distribution and who reparations should belong to is 180 degrees opposite to the Narcan and Cobra position. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear that. Okay. Um, I, I, I think somebody's trying to call you or you're getting notices and it's like making sounds. So you might want to put your phone on D and D do not disturb. Um, okay. But Thank you, Arthur, for that. And what we're going to do, I invite those of you who have the book to go along with us, to read along with us. Um, we're going to um, attempt, um, I mean, uh, Angie and Arthur, I hope you have your books out too, because we're going to attempt to go through this and uh, just do the breakdown and invite, you know, maybe after a couple of paragraphs or so, invite those to the stage who want to talk about what we just read um, another thing I put in the Jumbotron by the people media link. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, the copies of the book, uh, on there so you can read it for yourself and possibly listen to this podcast at a later time. And, um, but we're going to go through this thing. It's only 12 pages and you guys are like the, you know, brain, uh, brains of the promote, uh, of the movement for reparations. And I definitely want to do this breakdown because I don't want you going out there with misinformation or, no, you know, lacking the information and the tools that you need to really push back against some of the things that people are talking about. And a lot of the things dealing with just pure melanin will stop us coal from even getting reparations. So I'm on page two and I'm going to read the first two paragraphs. If you want to come oh, on well, stage, I'm sorry, Austin. Austin. Yeah. I want to I want to warn everybody to keep a sharp eye because the original has quite a few typos in it. And on my blog I corrected the typos. Okay. So right. just be aware of that. Okay. That's all. But and yeah, and I'm not reading from the blog. I'm going to just read from the direct manuscript that, and it's right. pure as possible. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, if please you don't read from the direct me. manuscript, be aware of that. Right, exactly. And that's this is before, like, not, uh, 1963 is when you had the old school typewriters and right. there was no spell check. So um, we forgive that. If you, if you ever tried to type on that thing, then you, you'll understand. Um but for yes, you would understand. <laughs> like, I look, those things are crazy. I never typed on one, or I tried, but it was like I was a kid. My mom, like, hey, this is a typewriter. I'm like, oh Lord, no. But anyway, um, we're going through it right now. And um, why reparations after 244 years of free slave labor and the most inhuman inhumane, uh, sinister, and barbaric atrocities, which pass in magnitude any savagery perpetrated against human beings in the history of the planet Earth, and an additional 100 years of so-called freedom accompanied by terror, the committee seeking reparations for the descendants of America's slaves, concludes that the payment of reparations is an absolute necessity if the government of the United States is ever to wipe the slate clean 
redeem herself and pay for the damages she has inflicted upon more than 25 million American citizens who are members of the black race. The payment of reparations is the only position American take America can take in the interest of justice and make an effort to restore the dignity to 13.1% of her citizenry. Okay, you know what? That's an opening paragraph, but I think it's powerful. If anybody wanted to comment on that, then they can come to the stage and, and uh, comment on that. Or you want me to keep reading? If you want me to keep reading? I'll keep reading. Let me keep reading. Please though. keep. Therefore, sure. Therefore, we, the committee for securing the reparations for the descendants of men and women brought from the continent of Africa and enslaved in the United States of America for more than 244 years and are now commonly referred to as Negroes, do now make formal requests of the government of the United States for fair and just compensation for the loss of property rights and the labor of our foreparents for which no payment of any kind has ever been made. The loss of so great a value in labor and skills by which means citizens of this nation who as a class call themselves slave owners over a period of 244 years became unjustly enriched, thereby making it possible the development of so many of the vast and numerous, numberless fortunes which even today accounts for a very considerable portion of this nation's wealth and is now due and payable to us as victims of this loss. I'm going to keep reading. Whereas the original drafters of the Constitution of this nation recognized the property rights in a man's labor, they recognized members of the black race only as chattels or animals. Consequently, black people were never thought of as attaining the status of men and women, and thus no consideration has ever had ever had, I'm sorry, had to be given to their labor and skills, nor any rights extended whatsoever to them, either legal or human. The signing of the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 belatedly bestowed the legal rights of ex-slaves and provided that they be classified as human beings, men and women. The proclamation also made it unlawful to continue to force ex-slaves to contribute to their labor and skills without fair compensation. Okay, I've read that first page. Let's open up the floor for people to be able to uh, comment, speak, ask questions. Anybody? No? Y'all want me to keep reading? Keep reading. Okay. Yeah. Page. Okay. This is page, page three. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States has now established that members of the black race in America, no matter how they came, nor the circumstances of their existence, are now and retroactively as being human beings. And human beings, these men and women, members of the black race, are logically and legally entitled to all the rights and benefits accorded to Caucasian men and women, including the right of inheritance and property rights which are also retroactive. Many years ago, the courts of the United States ruled that man or woman has a property right in labor and skills, and that such right is subject to the laws governing inheritance. Hence, under the inheritance law, members of the black race as human beings and citizens, despite national customs and practices, are governed and protected. The, that I'm sorry, the fact that no consideration was ever accorded members of the black race who as a class were called slaves and whose descendants as a class are now called Negroes has ever has compounded the original injury to those now called Negroes. This injury ranges all the way from chronic to extensive poverty causing suffering and emotional distress ranging from A, lynching, B, Jim Crow segregation, C, disenfranchisement, 
D, raping. E, denial right to vote in Southern states. F, police brutality. G, use of dogs and water hose. H, use of cattle probes, electric. Uh, I, use of horses and billy clubs. And widespread contempt and disdain, which we receive from our fellow citizens, not related to such class, or to mental mayhem, which conditions inevitably culminate in genocide, unless stopped. We, in the name of humanity, created by God to seek a full life while this earthly domain, while in this earthly domain, for the cause of justice for which mankind craves, for the sake of dignity which all men strive, we, the people of African origin, clo enclosed within the boundaries of the United States, do declare that we do not now or have we ever had equal protection under the laws of this country, which by customs are not enforced when we are involved. I want to stop right there. I, I want y'all to comment on what, what I've read so far. Because this, I mean, this is like chilling if you're reading it. And if you're really going over this thing, I've read it many times. And it's like she is, 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 it's a time capsule that's telling us about right now. This is like we're seeing when we're involved in um, when we're involved in, in any kind of legal situation or whatever the case may be, that we're put on a back burner status and all of a sudden things are changed. It's different now because the victim is is a freedman or whatever the case may be. Now that the victim is white, okay, wait a minute, this is going to take priority. It's receiving national or local news. Um, this is like, this is something I want, you know, you know, you guys to comment on. Cynthia, you had, um, you had something to say, sis. Go ahead. Hey, peace to the room. Um, so I just really just wanted just to comment specifically on the Black race, African descent, African origin, <clears throat> and now Negroes. I think if people want to keep in mind that, you know, I know that this statistic was actually brought up a, a, a while ago, but it's still important to remember, especially when we're keeping in mind of when this was written, is that the people that she's referencing in 1963 are not immigrants. They're not Black immigrants. They are the sons and daughters of those who descended from chattel slavery. Remember, Black immigration to the United States prior to 1965 was the right to the right of the decimal point. They were barely um, a blip on the, um, on the populace in the United States. We didn't really see a rev up of any type of Black immigration until the 80s and 90s. So this is important to keep in mind as far as like who she is referencing, who actually experienced all the atrocities or what she said, the compounded original injury to those now called Negroes. I have my pamphlet up too. I'm reading along with you, Roz. Just want to let you know. So this is very um, specific uh, injuries to a specific group when she was speaking about the lynching, Jim Crow segregation, disenfranchisement, raping, denial of the right to vote, and uh, police brutality, cattle prods, use of horses and billy clubs, and so on and so forth. These are very specific atrocities to a very specific group of people. And you can actually see the correlation to, you know, um, Black positionality, Black Americans who come from chattel slavery freedom in, uh, to today, and how the legacy of all these particular atrocities and the ongoing practices of benign neglect are still affecting us today. So it's important to keep all these th particular things in mind as we're reading through this, especially about who we are discussing and who are the people who actually absorb the main portion of the atrocities when it comes to why one is seeking reparations. 
Thank you for that, Cynthia. Absolutely. We're talking about a specific group of people and a specific and the specific injuries. This was not done to people that just because they had melanin and, and were around the world because they weren't here. This is done specifically to the people, and she mentioned it over and over and over again, people who descended from chattel slaves, people whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. She's not, she's not just saying just Black people because you had melanin. Um, I would like to hear from Brother Chad, too. Um, Brother Chad, you can, you can come in when uh, you unmute your mic. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, still early for me out here on the West Coast, so I'm not going to talk long. I did have to get my tea after listening to how good your coffee and the wine sounded, Arthur. <laughs> so got my tea here. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Arthur, for unearthing this document and, and sending it to us. I like I'm sure all of you read it many times because um, I had not seen anything written from Queen Moore. Um, so this was this was a, 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 a incredible discovery. So, you know, shout out to Arthur for for kind of resurfacing this information. Um, secondly, I think Cynthia, you know, pretty much summed it up very well. Queen Mother Moore in this pamphlet is speaking specific to our lineage. She is she is speaking specifically to cash payment reparations. And, you know, that aligns with what we're trying to do as contemporary reparationists around this country. Um, just for and Arthur, to your question, you know, how has this kind of influenced and what are we doing out here to utilize it? You know, I wish I had had this prior to the testimony on the 23rd. I think you sent it to me a, a couple of days afterwards. And, you know, this is some this is information that I would have liked to have included in that presentation. But post presentation, you know, I took this pamphlet and I've already shared it with, you know, a couple of the more Pan-Africanist leaning uh, task force members on the AB3121 task force. And hoping to have a conversation with them about this before we get to that March vote, um, you know, where we all know they will be kind of determining their the community of eligibility for AB3121 and out here in California. So from my perspective, this and, and I think Arthur said it very well, you know, Queen Mother Moore is one of the most mascotted, you know, identities within the Pan-African Pan movement. And so having a document written in her own hand, in her own words, where she is speaking specifically to lineage, she is speaking to cash payment reparations, it really, um, you know, blows up what we're hearing from these from these new Pan-Africanists. Right. And, it, and it, it really reveals how the messaging has been twisted and how we are we're not receiving the real messaging from some of the central figures that they hold up in their movement. And so for me, you know, that just further contributes to what we have been engaged in out here. And that is really moving those folks who, uh, for whatever reason, whether it be willful, or whether it just be confusion, are unable to see the fact that we have to move forward on, le on lineage, not only for legal purposes, but to make sure that it's our group that is receiving the benefits of anything that's called reparations. So for me, this is just another this is another bullet in the chamber. Uh, it's a big bullet. This is a this is a big caliber bullet. So, again, Arthur, thank you. And it's something that we're going to be weaponizing and using moving forward until we're able to just clear this clear this field of those that you know want to all black lives matter our reparations. So, you know, big shout out to Arthur. Big shout out, uh, Roz, to you for hosting this room. And I would encourage anybody to you know go to Arthur's blog, read the words of Queen Audley Moore. I would encourage anybody that when we are having this meeting for AB3121 um, on the 29th, you know, pull out the pamphlet and read a couple excerpts in her own words to the into the record um, and let folks know that we are, you know, we're doing the work and we're doing the research. Um, so you can't just, you know, spin these stories and these narratives to us anymore. We have Queen Mother Moore's words. I think those words should be present in the in the record. So that's all I had, Ross. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Chad. Appreciate you being up and 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 at it with your tea, cup of tea this morning and spilling the tea with us. Because yes, brother, um, th that's one of the things we need. We we have to consider. This is like um an elder 
for the Pan-Africans that want to disrespect her. To me, it's a matter of disrespect when you ignore an elder who's no longer here and you basically are not listening to her words. That's like your own grandmother telling you what she wants done with her house. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't want you to sell the property. I don't, I want to keep it in a family. I want to keep it in a family. And as soon as her eyes shut, you're trying to sell it to somebody outside for whatever the purpose that or, or whatever the case may be for your own en enrichment and personal pockets, that's a sign of disrespect for the elders. It's not a sign of respect to ignore the words of Queen Audley, Queen Mother Audley Moore uh, for them. And if they didn't know before, they do now. So I definitely want you all to be able to get that out. Arthur Ward, you, you unmiked yourself. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know what? The other thing too, when you when I was uh, because <clears throat> I, I didn't want to uh, put this thing out without any context behind it. When you look at her advocacy timeline, this was written in the middle of her rabbit pan Africanness. <laughs> I mean, she was like she was like you know, stomped down in terms of her pan African uh, identity, her pan African advocacy. And, 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 and her being a philosophical center of Pan-Africanism. But in the middle of all of that, she was able to compartmentalize herself for a few minutes and do this. So if she can do it, why can't Nark do it? Why can't Nkobe do it? Now, Thank whatever you, else is going on in yeah. their minds, you know, I don't know. But Chad is right. This needs to be worked into the record in some kind of way. This needs to be worked into the, the into the dialogue that's going on in California right now. Absolutely, absolutely. So definitely with that, we're gonna continue the reading. Um, I'm still on, we're on page four, and this is the uh second paragraph. We have since 1863 been victims of mob violence lynching and systematic systematized atrocities to a far greater extent than any other citizens or resident of this country. We charge that our language, culture, and heritage were methodically and deliberately destroyed. Our names and geographical identity were systematically obliterated. We are denied the legal right to shelter by discrimination, custom, segregation and subtle de facto segregation. The reparations committee is seeking relief in money damages for the victims of these injustices with which to begin a program of rehabilitation. It is further the desire of the committee that every well-meaning and patriotic American, whatever his position in life, do his utmost by word as well as deed to help this long overdue and just effort to erase the blot and stigma from the unfortunate past of America's history by public and official expiration for the wrongs heaped in uh, multiplicity upon a large mass of American citizens who have contributed so richly to America's culture, welfare, and safety. The Reparations Committee for United States Slaves Descendants Incorporated. And she gives the directors, uh, S. Alexander, Chairman of Board of Directors, Audley A. Moore, President and Founder, Charles H. Davis, National Chairman, Berta Forrest, National Recording Secretary, Stacy Adams, State Chairman of California. Did anybody else want to speak or want me to keep reading on? Because we're on page five. We're good. Okay. If you wanted to uh, speak, just raise your hand and the co-host will let you up on stage and I'll, I'll they'll let, they'll stop me. Um, poverty, the results of chattel slavery. The contents of this booklet are addressed not only to our people in particular who are victims of oppression, but also to the white people of the United States 
who need this great opportunity to cleanse themselves of wrongs done to our people by their cruel ancestors. By the way of preface, there is too little to say since the character of this work is embodied in this booklet, which is the fruit of untiring effort, research, and investigation into the phenomenon of our special oppression, which causes stem from antisocial nature of the slave system in this country with its reprehensible acts of barbarism which violated all natural laws of human aspiration and justice. The atrocious deeds done to our ancestors by the legion of white fiends rise before us in new and uh, irresistible horror. It is intended to meet the need of bringing to the people of this country a great principle of restitution by those of us who desire to raise our people from the a degradation of natural of national poverty resulting from the effects of chattel slavery, which have left us without national resources. Okay. Can I make a comment about that? Yes, ma'am. National resources. Now, when we we think of national resources, let's think of of it in regards to inheritance the inheritance of corporations, the inheritance of stocks, the inheritance of bonds, the inheritance of wealth. That's what that particular part means, national resources. Resources now that this country freely give other um, ethnicities without and with disregard to our own. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, there are job fairs set up specifically for new immigrants that are not U.S. citizens. They're they're set up for them to get benefits in this country and um, predominantly, um, you know, uh, Freedman County. So I don't I don't you people have to understand this. This lady, this this booklet, this pamphlet is actually. A, a looking glass into the future of what is happening right now. I can't even express that any more than that. Um, I'm going to continue reading. I'm in the third paragraph on page five. The fact that reparations has not yet been included along, along with the integrationalist leaders' demands is because they are underestimated the depth of the bitterness of our suffering and the intelligence of our people and spite our indomitable will to die for our rights like men and women on our feet rather than live on our knees. This was demonstrated by our unquenchable revolutionary fervor at the United Nations when the Honorable Patrice Lumumba of the Congo of Africa was murdered and on the picket lines and demonstrations throughout this country where our people in their massive efforts to become citizens endured the foul onslaught of tear gas, onslaught, I'm sorry, of tear gas, fire hoses and police dogs, police brutality and arrests to secure those rights denied us by the oppressive villains. Without reparations, our people can never be on equal terms with the white sons of our former slave masters who continue to reap the abundant benefits of wealth created by our foreparents through their, century, their centuries of unrequited labor. The unpaid labor of African slaves laid the foundation for the accumulation of the wealth that ultimately made the USA the richest country in the world. During the period of slavery, millions of our people died while being transported under conditions of indescribable horror while crossing the Middle Passage. Our roots and culture were ruthlessly destroyed. We were deprived of human status with families broken and fragmented and family ties eliminated. Our women raped and abused, our men placed in chains, bred like animals. Our children were taken from us and given over to owners and slave masters to be sold on the auction block. 
Today, our youth are taught false history, theories, and principles to present, prevent race pride. Can somebody say critical race theory arguments not being uh, t as, a, as a false argument, really, but them not wanting their own children to learn about the truth? Can somebody even throw that around? Now, I'm telling you, it's this uncanny how Queen Audley Moore, back in 1963, is talking about 2021, 2022 today. Did I have another, there's another speaker, um, co-host? Oh, no. Want me to continue reading? Yeah, continue reading. Okay. All right. Um, the reparations committee will present the evidence of the lawless vendors in human flesh in all of its sickening and horrible details. Through the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, we were ostensibly granted freedom and full citizenship with the ensuing amendments of the Constitution. But these were then and continue to be well withheld from us. Therefore, our suit demanding payment of a debt long overdue is justified, although no amount of reparations could adequately repay us <clears throat> excuse me, adequately repay us for the cruelty we suffered. Still, there must be a recognition of the crimes committed against us and a just settlement before the issue can be considered closed. The two major political parties of our oppressors, she goes into it, she doesn't, I mean, this is no joke, Democrats and Republicans have consistently tried to keep this issue of slavery and reparations hidden. But suppressing it has caused one of the greatest socioeconomic problems of this age. This issue is clear. No civilized human society would con contest and no democratic state would neglect or in this case shun its responsibilities to adequately recompense those from whom such sacrifices were extracted. Besides our unrequited labor, we have given genius to America, the genius of Benjamin Banneker, Harriet Tubman, Crispus Attucks, Dory Miller. African Americans have given their very lives to preserve the American dream, which they have not shared. The 100th year since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which had, was to free our people from chattel slavery, finds us suffering economic and political oppression in the USA. Therefore, the question of the continued subjugation of an entire people, landless and disenfranchised, deprived of equal status with the rest of the general populace, deprived of recognition of our contribution to the culture and enrichment of the economy remains. Somebody got to talk about that. That right there is powerful. This is back in, I mean, we're talking over about, this is close to almost 60 years. Well, Can somebody, well maybe, that's an, what, maybe, what's that's an maybe that's an indication nothing has changed. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Let's go. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Um, look at the patents that we created. Nothing has right. changed. If if, not... if 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 at least if if a minimum of eighty percent of this document uh, could have been written two days ago, uh, maybe nothing has changed. And maybe it's time for us to use this declaration of nothing changes that was published in 1963 as a way to make changes this year. And I believe this, this is why this pamphlet fell into the hands of the freedmen, the ADOS, the FBA, the, the, uh, the B1s. You know, I tried to send this to everybody because everybody on the specificity side of the fence need to have this as a weapon against this pan-African nonsense. Um, 
Uh, Queen Mother Moore, the other thing too, I, I don't think that the panties wanted us to know just how astute Queen Mother Moore was on the, on the subject of domestic issues, issues outside of her general purview of, of, uh, of Pan-Africanism. You know, uh, I don't know at this point what they're on or what they're trying to do and <clears throat> what, why they are going against uh, the lady that they say is their main philosophical source as far as like reparations eligibility and reparations distribution. You know, I, and, I, and I'm hoping that some of the people in this room can maybe give us more insight from their viewpoint as far as that is concerned. I mean, yeah, because she's 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 not. They're not um, in her document. Um, she's not cutting the corner. She's not tiptoeing around anything. She's coming straight to the point. And I think it's it's profound how how we speak in in this day and age regarding reparations, regarding the wealth gap, regarding the unjust that has befallen and and been made to happen, and and bottom cast you know, situation that we are locked into, it was, it's nothing changed and everybody wants to kind of ignore it. And she's even mentioning without saying it, she's giving the description for benign neglect that we're having to deal with and just vote for the Democrats, Blo vote blue no matter who, but there's nothing there for us. We, uh, we open a, a gift box and, and it's, it's air. And everybody else opens theirs and it's diamonds and, and, and jewelry and, and, and skates and everything else in there. But ours, we open it and it's just air. And we're supposed to be happy with the benign neglect. So that's what she is, is has already stated. Um, yes, Chad, you can come in, brother. Yeah, Roz, you, you kind of hit on the point that, that stood out to me when I read this particular section. You know, she's talking about how the Democrats and the Republicans are equal in their oppression of black Americans. And, you know, this again was in 1963 when the president was John F. Kennedy, you know, a figure that gets celebrated as being, you know, a, a friend to our community in many spaces. So I thought that was very powerful. Again, I think Arthur kind of nailed it that, you know, nothing has changed, nothing new under the sun. Um, what we see from in Queen Mother Audley Moore's words in 1963 still hold very true today. And so I, I agree with you, Roz. And, you know, she has provided us with, you know, a, a looking glass, you know, from 1963 into the future. But I think she also is saying that, you know, we need to be very aware of the conditions that have not changed. And like Arthur said, start weaponizing her words, the words of others, because this isn't the first time I've, I've run across this where we have an ancestor who was speaking to our current situation decades ago. Um, weaponize all the words of all our ancestors and the understanding that we have, you know, in, in all of our spaces to get us to this goal that's the, of, ju of economic justice that's so long overdue. So I just wanted to point out that, you know, 1963, we had Kennedy in office and these are the words that she is writing and it's extremely powerful to me. Thank you, know, you so I much. Can't help. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chad. You know, I can't help but wonder that this has been a long-term uh, plan or or conspiracy. I mean, I, I hate using that word conspiracy. Conspiracy. I, don't want to sound like a, I think it's I don't conspiracy. Wanna, I, I don't want to sound like a nut. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But check this out. Okay, so we know we know mm -hmm. Queen Mother Moore, but we are just now at this very late mm -hmm. date getting acquainted with things that actually came from her mind and her hand. But let me ask you this. And this is a uh, this, this is regarding another California. How many people know of uh, Attorney Dr. Robert L. Brock? How many people know of this guy? All right. Well, let me tell you a little bit about him. Doctor, now I don't know. I do not know if he's still alive. If he is, he would be like in his middle eighties right now. Okay. Uh, this was a person that was brought into the reparations conversation by Queen Mother Moore. And he also had a hand in, the, uh, in shaping the original HR 40, along with, he also had associations with the now deceased uh, Conrad Will, who was one of the 
founders of Encobra. And uh, Dr. Robert Brock fell out with Encobra uh, because he was adamant about cash payments for reparations. And even at that time, uh, uh, Conrad War Will and his associates were advocating that if reparations are paid, that they should not be direct payments to the eligible recipients, that it should go through a, uh, a, 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 an authority or commission run by them, and they would decide how reparations money would be spent. And he was adamantly against that. Now, there was very, very, very little information about Dr. Robert Brock on the internet. And as far as I'm concerned, I found two pieces of information that were uh, written by him. Other things regarding him is like uh, propaganda or negative propaganda about his practice, which I don't know if it's true or not at this point. But I do know that he was adamant about number one reparations, adamant about lineage reparations, and adamant about cash payments being the form of reparations that should be paid out. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a lot of other characters in the specificity, on the specificity side of things uh, that were around years ago that we don't know about and have been suppressed by the uh, by Narcan and Cobra. I brought up Robert Brock to Cam one day when I was having a conversation with him. He knew about Robert Brock. I said, how come y'all guys never talk about it? He said, well, you know, he's always been a problem and all that. I see why he's been a problem because he has the same views on, on reparations as Queen Mother Moore. So anybody that has those kind of views or, or, or thoughts are going to be problematic. And so we're a problem. And so since we're a problem and we have this document, we need to distribute this thing to as many people as possible. 